Welcome back. I'm Alfred Lamont Weber, and we're very privileged today to have coming from Berkeley, California, independent scientist, Loren Moray. Welcome, Loren. Thank you, Alfred. Uh, it just seems like every every interview we've done has been exciting, and um, it just seems like the really exciting f <laughs> information and, and news seems to come and stick to us. I think it picks us out. <laughs> well, to, to, today is uh, 322 that, uh, you know, Skull and Bones number, March 22nd, the day after right. the spring equinox. It's the, uh, you know, there's weaving together, as we were talking before the program, all of these threads, Pope, the patriarch, uh, uh, Obama's in Cuba, Castro, Argentina, the Antarctic, Brussels, the false flag in Paris, I mean, in um, Brussels, growing, growing out of and done by Gladio, more synthetic terror. And um, perhaps you can weave all of these themes to us, which seem to have been uh, uh, coordinated over the spring equinox. It's, it's really odd. It's not really odd. If well, well the, the, the odd fellows are masons, so it's one of those, it's one of those rabbit holes. It's not odd at all when you bring it into the context of the ancient history, and then it all makes sense. And you do that by looking at these signs and symbols, not the written word or the laws. They're irrelevant. It's all signs and symbols, and it's all there, and the story is very simple, and it's very clear. Now, 322, 322 uh, can be March 22nd, uh, which is the day after Persian New Year, or Nuruz, which is on the spring equinox. All of these countries that are involved in the Middle East have ancient Iranian tribal ties and bloodlines and so forth. It's a very complex area, and it's a very, very old area. And um, it just happens that March 22nd is also the culmination of the um, the three-day feast of the the satanic feast of Pelusia and uh, this is the um, invocation of Isis the ancient Egyptian Isis or the death cult now the Isis in capital letters is the um, the terrorists which uh, are tied to uh, Islam. However, they're not practicing uh, really true is Islam uh, and following religious laws and so forth. They are actually a proxy army, military, uh, fanatical on drugs, uh, uh, just mind controlled and brainwashed by the, um, the uh, most of it happens in the, the mosques by the religious leaders, and um, it's just turning uh, Europe into total chaos. It's grinding up uh, the Middle East. Uh, terrorism is spreading all over the world. But uh, just remember, this is not uh, a result of Islam and true religious beliefs in any religion. This is a war. This is a military war, a military conflict, and it's a global war for control of the Red Sea, for instance, because the Red Sea with the Suez Canal is the uh, one of the um, the it is the only trade trade route that the Middle Eastern uh, oil and, and gas and energy sources can take. Uh, down through the Red Sea to get into the um, the Gulf of Aden and then continue uh, across Southeast Asia by water. So this is actually the south road or the south thread of the new Silk Road. And of course, the new Silk Road extends from Beijing to Moscow, 
Berlin, uh, Vienna, um, the, the Middle East, um, and it ends at Egypt. At the north end of the Red Sea, the Egyptians have given Russia two square kilometers uh, right on the Mediterranean, right where the Red Sea enters the Mediterranean as a free trade zone and also uh, they have a military presence there as well. And at the south end of the Red Sea, up opposite the Bab al-Mandab uh, Straits, which are um, between Yemen and um, Djibouti, uh, that's the entrance to the Red Sea at the south end. And the uh, Chinese now have a, um, uh, a refueling and resupplying base at Djibouti for their military ships. And uh, now there's a battle for the island of uh, Socorro, which belongs to uh, Yemen. Socotra. Oh, I'm sorry, it's Socotra. And um, so this is what all this conflict in the Middle East really is all about. And now the war in Yemen is falling apart, and the U.S. is sending military ships there. So all of this is uh, part of ancient history it's modern history, and it's the future. It's very important to understand all of it. And so this false flag that occurred in Brussels um, is related to the refugees uh, that have been flooding into Europe, and it's the Chancellor uh, Mer Merkel of Germany who initiated that and has been pushing and pumping that. But we know that Merkel is a Nazi, a fascist at heart uh, from her comments and verbiage and attitude at the time that uh, Greece was going through the International Monetary Fund uh, troubles and chaos. And uh, she came out with very fascistic statements and, and, and a position that was unacceptable. And she got a lot of criticism for that. But all, the, all these players are, are doing things um, under the table, and, and they know e each other, and they know what their role is. But uh, most people don't understand. So this, um, this event in uh, Brussels, um, oh, also uh, the 22nd is also with the, uh, the, the Satanic Feast of Pelusia is also to pay homage to Ishtar, who was the ancient Mesopotamian goddess of fertility, um, love, war, and sex. And um, at that time, um, it was most... Uh, celebrated in the upper part of Mesopotamia, which was ancient Assyria. And uh, it's really interesting that uh, this is modern northern Iraq, um, modern uh, northeast Syria, and southeast Turkey. This is all the Kurdish area also, which is related to the celebration of Nuru's yesterday, um, so you see by, by the Kurds and, and other Iranian uh, populations and tribes. So you can see that the Brussels event was all connected to NATO, to Gladio. This was a Gladio-NATO um, uh, false flag. And um, the um, ISIS, the celebration of ISIS, or revocation of, of the, um, I'm sorry, the uh, paying homage to ISIS. Um, that was the death cult in ancient Egypt, but um, it's also can stand for capital I, capital S, capital I, capital S, the ISIS, the very ISIS that uh, countries are fighting in the Middle East right now, and ISIS is spreading all over the world. Now, this does really connect ISIS to NATO and to um, to Gladio, and this is definitely tied to the Rand Corporation in um, Santa Monica, 
to um, the creation of NADA under the Marshall Plan and to the plan uh, by the Rand Corporation, this is decades ago, to carry out, create and carry out the very refugee crisis that is happening right now in Europe. And so their plan was to go and destroy countries in the Middle East and create uh, uh, refugee populations, displaced people, and to shove them into Europe to destroy, uh, to destroy Europe. Now that is exactly what they're doing. And all these acts of terrorism are uh, simply political necessities, political moves to uh, change uh, people's minds or to change the direction of, of the uh, global or regional politics. And that's what we see happening right now. Um, now, um, it's, of course, uh, the Middle East is all involved in this, too. Um, I think it's just horrible. I think it's just uh, unfathom unfathomable to see this deliberate destruction of civilizations, of religions, of, of uh, uh, culture, of ancient relics, of archaeological sites. They're just destroying everything, and there's no reason for it. But um, this has happened many, many times over the last 5,000 years. It's by these ancient Iranian bloodlines. And since the Renaissance, uh, when the um, Jesuits were created uh, by Pope Paul III, who was Fidel Castro's direct ancestor, Fidel Castro is actually one of these ancient Iranian bloodline families that run the world. And um, um, he's, he's actually Iranian. He's not uh, Spanish or anything else. He's not uh, Cuban. He's, he's actually Iranian. And they have very strict uh, breeding pro programs as well. So we'll talk a little more later on in the conversation about who is Fidel Castro and what is he commanding and through what mechanisms is he controlling the world. And a lot of this has to do with California. So uh, what would you like to um, cover next? Well, I, I'm, I'm just thinking that um, uh, there were some themes that, that we carried over from the last program involving Pope Francis, the patriarch, and all meeting Castro in Cuba and the Jesuit Pope simultaneously bringing all religions under the Vatican and the false dawn of a one world religion. If that is an initial theme you want to explore as part of this. Yes, we actually ended uh, promising to do cover that in our next um, news program. So um, the fact that the Pope, who is Jesuit, uh, met with Patriarch Kirill uh, from the Moscow Russian Orthodox um, uh, Center or a headquarters is very, very significant because the schism uh, over a thousand years ago, around the time of the Crusades, a little bit before that, uh, between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church, which caused the splitting of that church, um, is very, very important and very significant, and it overshadows everything about this meeting and what's going to happen in the future in terms of, of religions and um, uh, of forming a one world this movement to start a one world religion. Why would they want to do that? So um, it's also very significant that this meeting between the Pope and Fidel Castro, uh, I'm sorry, and uh, Patriarch Kirill happened in Cuba with Fidel Castro. Now, He's an atheist. Jesuits are atheists. He's a Jesuit. His family started the Jesuits. And um, he has a lot to say and a lot to do about what happens in the world. 
So uh, remember, they went to him. So they are working for Castro and uh, who, whatever uh, power center he belongs to. Um, the meeting um, in uh, Cuba is the first meeting, like I said, between a pope and, um, and the Russian Orthodox high uh, leadership in over a thousand years. Uh, why in the world would they meet in, <laughs> in Cuba at the headquarters of the Jesuits? It's like bizarre. The Jesuits are, are an army. They, they're outside of the Vatican. They're sort of connected, but they are independent of the Vatican. So they had their meeting, and um, the uh, patriarch, uh, Kirill, went on to Argentina. That's also strange. And uh, he had meetings and so forth there. However, it's not so strange when uh, you understand that Pope Francis came from Argentina. So there is a power center now in Argentina as well as Argentina having a very, very large claim to Antarctica. And Antarctica and the mineral pie and the mine control bases in Antarctica are very, very important globally to the New World Order. So uh, that it and and Kirill went on to Antarctica, so to the Russian base there. Uh, they have about uh, seven there. Uh, England has about nine. Uh, Ru uh, Japan has three. I don't know how many the U.S. has. I haven't been able to find out. But all these things are a huge rollout of this millennium uh, Silk Road project and a whole new society and new rules and, and new everything. And what they want to do is make one world religion, bring all people under one world religion. They want to make the Silk Road uh, the new global economy, and they're well on their way to doing that as far, and also this is where Putin comes in. You were asking where he comes into this. Um, he's also started a new world bank and a whole new world banking system, including um, uh, money in gold for the countries like Asia and the Middle East who don't like paper money. They like to deal in silver and gold uh, coins, and, and um, uh, that's how they do it. So it's accommodating their preferences as well. And it's gotten off to a, quite a good start. Um, I'm quite surprised at how fast all of this is happening. Um, the, um, the south side of, uh, or the, uh, the first leg of the Silk Road Railroad has already uh, had a train pass over it a week or two ago. So that's the opening volley of the Silk Road. Um, and that was, uh, that was quite exciting. The train uh, left uh, um, Beijing and arrived in Tehran about a week and a half ago. Um, so let's go back to um, this, uh, this religious thing. Now, um, in the 1930s, starting in about 1930, a lot of the, the issues, the, um, the we could say applications or the the framework of the new agenda for the new world order was being discussed in certain circles. Asimov, uh, Bertrand Russell, um, there was a, a new uh, false religion created in Japan, Soka Gokai, and it was set up by the Jesuits to infiltrate um, the, um, the Nichiren Buddhist sect, and uh, it's a very, very old sect from about the 1200s, from the Kamakura Temple. I've been there. It is a beautiful 80-foot pure copper uh, or pure, pure bronze. No, it's copper. Um, Buddha, oh God, it's so beautiful. And, um, and Castro has uh, a guy there in uh, Los Angeles, who is um, a 
he's a Cuban Jesuit married to a Japanese woman, and he was running the um, the Nichi Rin Nichi Sokai Soka Gokai uh, lay uh, program, um, and um, and so there's another tie between Castro and the and he goes this uh, this man who is there goes all the time to Cuba, and he's very good friends, very close to Castro. So there is the flow. Uh, Cuba, Los Angeles, Japan, back and forth, back and forth. And what that um, that uh, institute or that facility in Santa Monica is doing is they're bringing in a lot of, they're targeting certain groups of people like indigenous people. They have a real strong recruiting program to bring American Indians in, to bring Filipinos in, to bring Japanese in, to bring Chinese in because uh, they're using these people, uh, for instance, the Native Americans, they're getting them on drugs and they go back and spread drugs around the, the reservations and what the goal for the New World Order is, uh, it's to destroy their cultures, it's to um, de-land them. In other words, um, they put all these gambling casinos on them funded by the Rothschilds and the Chinese and it's destroyed the culture on the uh, on these reservations as well as families with children are expelled from the reservations so that the greedy people there small groups of people are taking over the whole reservation the flow of money through the gambling casinos and then they get all the revenue from the minerals uh, that are being mined and produce money. Um, well, basically, the Rothschilds are involved in almost all the all the reservations in looting their um, natural resources. So you can't. I mean, this is this is all about God. That's for sure. But let's put an asterisk after G O D, and um, you get gold, oil, and drugs is their God. So um, the Soka Gokai uh, was uh, it, um, it was um, uh, investigated finally by the Nichiren in the early 1990s and they expelled all of the leadership immediately when they realized they were uh, Jesuits infiltrating the, uh, the Buddhist sect. And um, they, the Soka Gokai still uses Nichiren, although they've been prohibited from using it and expelled from the Nichiren Buddhist movement or sect. Uh, but they continue recruiting. Um, it's all for uh, very dark reasons, uh, typical New World Order reasons, and, and it destroys a lot of people and their cultures. It's not a good thing at all. And um, there are a lot of Soka Gokai facilities in Italy, surprisingly. So um, that that's one. That's when um, this whole New World Order thing started around the 1930s. Asimov was writing about robots. That's from the the um, the Surf Program under the Habsburg Empire called Robota. And uh, basically, it's slavery. And um, there are a lot of other writers who uh, were writing at that time that have written very famous books and very influential. Um, but it's all New World Order stuff, and we see it all rolling out now. Um, now, Father Berrigan, who's very famous for his activism, is also a Jesuit. And... Um, he was living in something called Jonah House, and I interacted with them a lot during the 2003 Iraq War. They were some of them were in prison and for protesting that war and so forth and so on. And I couldn't really understand what they were doing. Um, there was a rabbi, and there were other religious groups living in that same house, Jonah House, and it just seemed strange. The um, there was a theater of tension and, and uh, something about their agenda wasn't being um, really revealed. 
well now I understand um, that they were part of this one world one world religion movement and um, uh, so that's pretty much uh, what we're, we're going to talk about except that uh, the uh, the most of the white Russians were killed in the Bolshevik Revolution over 20 million people no over 70 million Russians were killed between World War One and World, the Bolshevik Re Revolution and World War Two, and um, the White Russians were basically the Russian Orthodox Christians. They're the ones who were targeted and killed and murdered by the Bolsheviks, and in the two world wars, um, the headquarters when the schism came between the Pope and the um, the Orthodox. Uh, leaders over a thousand years ago, the uh, it was actually um, Constantine who took the Orthodox Church to Constantinople. We know it as Istan Istanbul today, and he built a really beautiful, beautiful, beautiful uh, cathedral that's still there. It's chillingly beautiful, and uh, later on the headquarters were moved to Moscow to Russia. So they wiped out most of the Orthodox Christians, Russian, Russian Orthodox Christians, uh, by the end of World War II. But a lot of them escaped and went around the world um, and settled in their, um, their, settled and started new communities and new Orthodox churches. So they, they own land all over the world, but not in Russia. So now, um, the um, the Jesuits and Castro want to bring all of the religions under the Vatican. And remember, Castro is papal nobility. He's descended from a pope, even though he was Iranian. Actually, a lot of the popes were Iranian. Uh, the Italians are all Iranians. They're they're just uh, everything about their art, iconography their food preferences, their religious practices, their burial practices, uh, many, many things, the clothes, um, it all reflects Central Asian um, culture. Well, so, um, mm -hmm. yeah, w w some of the analysis around Castro, especially since the biography of one of his bodyguards was published, where it was clear that he had over 24 mansions. He lived on a private island. All of this was the highest secret of national security. His, his income was classified. He got a personal percentage off of all of the national revenue, including fisheries, petroleum, mineral rights, all of that. So he was on the model of the, you know, uh, um, the communist dictator. In fact, uh, so one or two of the communist dictators from the minor uh, Soviet, uh, di ex-Soviet dictatorships uh, like Armenia and, and others used to come and visit him and they would have secret meetings at his, at his private island with his many yachts and uh, they, they, they lived in a very rarefied atmosphere. Uh, so he's been described as actually an Illuminati asset. And it was no accident that the New York Times, quote, discovered him in the mountains of the Sierra Maestra in 1959 and set up, set up Castro as a key kind of irritant or, or fulcrum between Russia and, and the United States almost ending the war, the, the world in a nuclear confrontation between Khrushchev and, and Kennedy, which I'm sure was managed, you know, so he was, you know, they, they set Castro up as sort of a key person almost at the end of the world. And then uh, uh, it's well known that Castro set up Guevara and had him assassinated uh, probably at the behest of the Illuminati because Guevara was a true revolutionary and had set off on his own 
to try and uh, radicalize the uh, peasants in, in Latin America. I was down there at the time in, in 1968. So I'm, I'm just wondering to take that kind of overlay and here we have Obama, who is a, um, an Illumina Illuminati asset funded by the Queen, by the, you know, by the Rockefellers, uh, uh, rumored to be uh, actually a, a, a crypto imam named Suad Barka from a cult leader in Indonesia, he's not even African American, and sort of teleguided through the secret time travel program, never really went to Columbia, never really went to Harvard Law. There's paperwork that uh, the chairman of the Board of Estimate of the City Council of New York gave $20 million as a contribution to Harvard Law so that uh, to pay for uh, his Harvard Law diploma. So he's a complete, what they call, Manchurian candidate. And I wondered if you could kind of Jesuit agent, in other words, it, if you could, you know, f fill in the blanks or put, sort of f flesh it out, this, this phony war that we've had since 1959 uh, around Castro between the United States, Russia, uh, uh, Soviet Union, Castro, the U.S., and it's all phony baloney. Well, let's just um, let's just um, look at it as uh, Castro was the juggler, and um, the balls in the air were all those countries you just mentioned, and so his job was to create a theater of tension in the Americas, but it spread globally. And then to keep all the balls in the air, to keep up this uh, facade, it was one gigantic false flag, is what it <laughs> what it is now too. And um, so I I started investigating um, Fidel Castro after I found out about that biography. I'd already discovered that he was descended from Pope Paul the Third and from ancient bloodlines. And um, it was from a book uh, about the splendor of uh, Pope Paul and the Farnese's. Uh, Pope Paul was from the House of Farnese's, an ancient Iranian house or uh, family, uh, very, very rich and um, titled family. And originally, in this book written by a Danish woman, um, in about 2005, maybe 2005 or 2007, and I believe that the Farnese, House of Farnese commissioned her to write it because I couldn't get a copy of it anywhere, but there is, um, uh, it is on the internet in a, in a CD or DVD form that you can download and burn on a disc and then read all the pages of the book as you um, scroll through and stop on certain pages. And in that book, I discovered that the Farnese's originated in the Parthian Empire, the first world empire, the Persian Empire. And it's those people that these ancient bloodlines come from, originated from, and also the preference for enslaving humanity, and I must say they are and were very cruel, very, very cruel culture, uh, especially certain of the tribes um, or families. And uh, so um, in terms of um, the Farnese's, they left Parthia. They had to flee when their dynasty collapsed, so they went to eastern Turkey um, which in, in Cappadocia, they settled there for a while, and then they migrated across the Mediterranean into Italy. And they settled in the northern part, especially the Piedmont, at the foot of the Alps, which has a beautiful climate, beautiful lakes and from glacial melt, and 
it's just lovely there and perfect very good weather for growing grapes and then venice was um in a lagoon and uh, that's where the ancient iranians also settled where they were safe and they established a very 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 wealthy um, trading uh, center there from venice uh, it later spread or expanded to genoa and then the Dutch East India Company and the East India Company would come and trade with them. And also um, the navigators for most of the explorers and for the East India Company and the Dutch East India Company came from Genoa or from Venice. So um, by having the navigators be their guys, they still knew they were spying on everyone all of the traffic on the seas and the trade by different countries. So um, also the, uh, the Doge of Venice traditionally wore a very high uh, sort of domed, probably beaten felt hat, which uh, comes from Central Asia and it was worn by the Shahs or the tri tribal chiefs. So um, there's one of the ties uh, the signs and symbols that this is uh, originally, the Italians were originally from uh, Central Asia. Also, the red slippers that the Pope wears are Central Asian. They're something that um, you would see in India or the Middle East, um, typical of uh, those regions. But those are all uh, mostly Iranian bloodlines, too, very ancient ones. And um, it's, it's really fascinating. It's very, very fascinating to find all these signs and symbols. It's really exciting. Um, every time I'm watching the news of the war coverage in, in Middle Eastern countries, I'm seeing Assyrians, ancient Assyrian uh, Christians. And they've lived there on that land for at least 2,000 years. They've been through lots of wars. Um, they've been through Genghis Khan. They've survived all kinds of stuff. Uh, American warships are just another iterage uh, of, of what they've already been through many times. And uh, you see the Western countries are much younger. Um, they didn't even really have um, any banking institutions. They, they didn't have firehouses or hospitals, you know, public service institutes and agencies um, and uh, by the by the time of the the Crusades they still didn't have an infrastructure and the Crusaders actually um, decided in northern Europe probably in the Brussels area to um, create a false um, crusade uh, b uh, based on religion but actually it was to go to the Mediterranean and to revive the Silk Road, which was in, in, in decline, and redirect it into Europe, which would uh, provide huge funding in Europe for uh, whatever they wanted to do with it, to make them rich, actually. So um, it wasn't until the Crusaders brought the Mores, or the Moorish people, the Saracens, back to Europe that they the, they created the, um, the whole banking institutions. They created Switzerland as a, um, a way to, uh, to hide your money. The, the Knights Templars and other crusaders could hide their money in Switzerland so that the kings of the countries they lived in could not confiscate it or steal it. And so Switzerland has always been a haven for um, money, for money. And, and also uh, other people, uh, you know, like very rich oligarchs and so forth and so on. And um, so this very rich history with uh, Christian villages being burned down in Syria and destroyed by these, uh, these uh, terrorists. And um, the, oh, it's just what they've done is horrible. But um, this has happened before, and um, let's see. I got I got off track. Um, help.
help me a little bit. <laughs> right, right. Well, well, what, what what we're doing is it's just uh, trying to trace. <clears throat> I guess mm -hmm. what we're calling is the hidden history of Castro. Right. And and he yes. was this this guy, right? Right. Hidden in Cuba, which you know it used to be like the dance capital of the world. Right. And and all of a sudden it became like the nuclear war horror of the world yes. and then it became the literacy capital of the world right and then but fidel castro was like this guy hidden under a rock there who would appear right you know now and then uh but all of a sudden you know on cuba this island i mean i spent 18 years there i mean you know not you know the first 18 years of my life more or less were spent between the U.S. and Cuba, and and uh, uh, all of a sudden it's like, you know, the Pope, the first Jesuit Pope is converging. They're doing a deal with the with the Orthodox to bring about a first religion. Obama's flying into Cuba, and uh, uh, they're they're doing a thing there. But on his way to Argentina which is right where the artificial intelligence deposits are of the Falklands War, but right above, as you pointed out, uh, where the reported world mind control bases are. Don't forget that in 1946, Admiral Byrd went down with mm -hmm. a fleet to try and wipe out the reported underground Nazi bases there and got that fleet got their, their you know what whipped and they they had to flee because there was advanced weaponry down there and obama after buenos aires is going down to bariloche which is further down the peninsula that's down in the area when i was down there speaking they they took me to go to go see the hotel where hitler stayed after the war uh -huh. i don't know but there's a lot of folklore down there and uh so could, could you comment on on that well um there's definitely a lot going on in antarctica first of all um there are a number of countries that have very large slices of the mineral pie and antarctica is two continents that are welded together right down the middle and there are a lot of minerals that will be uh, mineral deposits that will be mined but um I think that right now what's more important to them is setting this uh, global mind-controlled world up and um, that is certainly part of uh, what what people are going down there to see and uh, as I said there are a lot of bases there and uh, what, what would Japan have a base named Pansy for which is from the word pensée, which is French for thought or thinking. And I found the photographs of this particular new base that opened two months after Fukushima happened. It went operational in Antarctica, a thought control base for Japan, and, um, um, uh, it, and they have two other bases as well, and they have HARP all over Japan. They have it everywhere, lots of facilities. And uh, Kyoto University is the headquarters for HARP, and Osaka is the um, headquarters for the Rothschilds and the nuclear weapons program. They do have a secret nuclear weapons program. But let's go back to what I was talking about, and I want to finish that. Uh, I was talking about Italy. Um, I did not mention that Fidel Castro's ancestor uh, was actually one of the ten generals uh, who protected uh, Alexander the Great. This is a long time ago. And there were ten Iranian Iranian bloodline uh, generals who protected him and uh, Castro's ancestor um, I don't know what his last name was but this general was sent by Alexander the Great to be governor of ancient Egypt and um, so he went to the governor and 
uh, Alexander sent his sister to marry him. And, um, and so uh, Alexander dr died, and so uh, Castro's uh, ancestor decided to take over the pharaoh's throne of Egypt and made himself a pharaoh and his wife, um, uh, Alexander's sister, was his partner. And that dynasty was the last dynasty of ancient Egypt, and it was called the Ptolemies. Now, this is where the cult of Isis, the cult of death worshipping, must have come into um, the uh, practices and everything of these ancient Iranian bloodlines and how they control populations and so forth. And uh, Isis... Uh, the death cult is uh, very, very, very uh, prominent in the rituals and so forth of the, the Knights Templars, of the um, Knights of Columbus, of uh, the Knights of Malta. All these uh, world leaders are, are partners and uh, members of, of many of these, uh, these ancient clubs. So we see those signs and symbols. Pedophilia, by the way, is a big part of it. And it's, in, it's to uh, be able to distance people, leaders, from the common people so they have no feeling about them. They have no guilt about how they're abusing them or killing them or genociding them or whatever. And um, also, they can be blackmailed with the, the information that they are committing pedophile on children, pe pedophilia on children. So uh, Castro, uh, his family eventually ended up in, in the New World in, uh, when Columbus and the, the Spanish and Portuguese came to discover um, North America, Central America, and South America. And um, this uh, led me to wonder, uh, I always wondered, why was Castro in Cuba? And what was he doing there? And who were the Jesuits? I didn't understand that. I just knew that Spain had plundered a lot of the New World and killed a lot of the Indians. And that's about all I knew. Well, I'm discovering a whole lot more now. And uh, what I finally got was um, a list from a U.S. Supreme Court lawsuit in the middle 1800s. Um, and it was with regard to the uh, original Spanish land grants that had been granted by Spain to uh, Spaniards who came to uh, California. Well, it wasn't called California then, but it was a, a Spanish part of America. And in the, um, let's see, in around the uh, mid-1800s, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Spanish government and the American government um, eventually agreed that the Spanish lands or the Spanish part of the Americas would, of America would be transferred to the U.S. government. But there was a treaty of Guadalupe and Hidalgo made that guaranteed that the Spanish land grant holders would be able to retain their Spanish land grants under the, the U.S. government. And um, once that was agreed, the land was transferred, and the state of California immediately filed a lawsuit against all the Spanish land grant holders to deny them their uh, rights to their own land. And that was... Um, um, uh, addressed by the U.S. Supreme Court. There were over 850 claims uh, or claimants who claimed they had uh, land grants for parcels of land. And the U.S. Supreme Court had to look at each individual claim and determine whether it was valid or not. And they found over 670 grants were valid and the people were allowed to keep the land. Now, that list is on the Internet under um, Spanish land grants in California. It's in, it's in Wikipedia. And when I started looking at it, uh, 
I kept seeing the name Castro, and pretty soon I realized Castro was the most common common name, the biggest uh, grant grantee. And they had very also tended to have large parcels of land. Um, Ca Cabrillo was um, another no yes uh, Carrillo Carrillo was, Carrillo was another a big landowner after Castro the name Castro. So this but the first names were different. So this was the House of Farnese uh, claiming these Spanish land grants. And Carrillo was also a very, very wealthy Spanish family who um, had large claims, and they were allowed to keep theirs. And they, for instance, um, the Carrillos uh, owned Santa Barbara, Solvang, um, uh, Ventura, all that area in north and south of Santa Barbara. And the, um, the let's see, the... Um, um, it's a big ranch in, in Southern California. Um, Joan, um, I can't remember. It's, I've forgotten. But anyway, that was part of uh, the Carrillo land grants as well. But then I started looking at w the county and the, the town where the Spanish land grants were, are, and uh, these are the modern county names and the modern city or, or, or village names. And I discovered that um, the Castros had a land grant in, a Spanish land grant in San Diego. Well, there's a UC San Diego there. They owned, uh, they had a land grant uh, uh, for Coronado Island in San Diego Harbor. Well, that's the US Navy there. Um, they had one in Salinas, um, and um, those are, oh my God, they're at least 20 miles at least of nothing but vineyards along the, the freeway. There are huge, huge, huge vineyards there that one big entity has planted. I suspect that's Castro. Also, um, Monterey, they had a land grant at Monterey. Well, that's where the Navy is. The U.S. Uh, Navy uh, Foreign L Language School. Um, it's where the Loma Prieta earthquake was triggered from a harp earthquake by the U.S. Navy that affected the whole Bay Area and collapsed part of the Bay Bridge. Um, they also, uh, also Leon Panetta, who is also an ancient uh, Iranian bloodline. He's uh, in Uzbek, and I suspect that Castro is from the Uzbek uh, side of those uh, those tribes. Uh, they are the leaders, and um, uh, uh, Panetta also is from a village. His father was in Italy, that is the home of the Nudrangheta uh, drug and uh, mafia f uh, family. And every male in the village is required to be a member of the Nadrangheta, which means that Panetta's father was, and so Panetta also has to be. And uh, while he was Secretary of Transportation for Clinton, I thought that was kind of strange. Uh, what was he doing? Well, Clinton built the Mineta Airport for the Rockefellers. He's um, an illegitimate Rockefeller through his mother, and the Mineta Airport is a... You mean uh, M Mina Airport? I mean the Mina Airport, yes. Is, um, it's a, it's a, um, a special status where the U.S. has no... Um, uh, they can't go in with um, police or anything. It's like a... a it's like a... Free trade zone. It's like a free trade zone. And these huge 747s land there and in Waco all day long, loaded with China white heroin that they're flying into the U.S. And they're distributed around the U.S. by the Walmart and the Tyson chicken trucks. So that's the distribution route. And the also the, um, the, the NAFTA highway is for drugs going north and it will be for minerals and mining products coming south 
from Canada. There's going to be a huge mining effort all over the United States and in Canada, Antarctica. They're going to destroy all the environmental laws and there will be no protections for the environment. It's going to happen very fast. Um, so then, um, uh, let's see. Uh, so that's Monterey. So Panetta actually redesigned the whole Nadrangheta. He used the, minister, the uh, Secretary of Transportation under Clinton to set that up, the distribution. Then he was head of the CIA, appointed by uh, Obama for two years. That's how he, and that, that had been taken over by the Jesuits already. The CIA is all Jesuit now. So he was setting up the drug, drug, drugs and other things uh, for the Jesuits um, as head of the CIA. And then Obama sent him to be Minister of Def uh, Secretary of Defense. And of course, that's all the, um, the uh, military part of drugs and, and global drug distribution. And the Jesuits, by the way, are the biggest drug uh, racketeering mafia in the world. And what Panetta did was he redesigned the Nidrangheta as a, um, on the model of the Maidalin cartel. So he streamlined it, and it's, it's now the biggest global drug mafia. Uh, that's awfully interesting. It happened awfully fast, too. And... Um, I, I just couldn't believe that Panetta was doing that or what he was doing or where he was from. So I went to the local newspapers in Italy around the town that, that he's from, and I was looking for photos of Panettas. Well, every Panetta photo that I found, uh, they were Panettas all right. These are his cousins, but they were all in handcuffs in the back of a police car in in um, um Milan or in uh, uh, Rome or wherever. So they are definitely, Panetta is definitely involved in drugs and that's part of, Castro's part of that too. So it makes sense that Monterey would be a headquarters for them. Uh, then uh, the Castros had um, a land grant in Castro Valley. Now that's not very far from the Livermore Lab and a lot of lab people and scientists and so forth live in Castro Valley. It's always been a weird town. Um, there was a Castro land grant in Livermore, which is where the Livermore Nuclear Weapons Lab is located. Um, now we're getting into nuclear weapons. Solano County, uh, they have a land grant there. Um, that's where UC Davis was, the monkey colony, the mine control. And UC Davis is very, very tied to Livermore Lab. And um, that's, that's, uh, that was part, oh, HARP was also developed at Livermore Lab. And um, I worked there. Uh, I didn't know anything about HARP when I worked there. But um, I certainly know a lot more now. And it's a pretty horrible weapon system. It's global, too. So then uh, also, also the Castros have... I had a land grant in Fresno. That's another UC uh, campus site. So here we have UC Davis also. So here we have most of the UC campuses are in towns or areas where the um, Castro's had, the House of Castro had Spanish land grants. And it's just no, it's just no, absolutely no um, accident or um, uh, it's absolutely planned, and it absolutely points to Castro as and the the House of Castro is owning California. Um, UC Davis has been taken over by Monsanto, and actually, all over throughout the UC system, University of California system, I'm seeing uh, signs and symbols of Jesuits coming out everywhere and taking over every campus. And it's getting really ugly. They're closing the chemistry department at UC Berkeley. Uh, what they're going to do is put the special sciences that can undo this new world order science nightmare uh, world that they're creating. Uh, they're taking the, the disciplines of science that were used to create it 
and they're isolating them in special restricted areas and restricted only to certain students that they filter and they, they know they can um, uh, control. And they will are the only ones who will have access to the sciences. Uh, mathematicians, they really don't want mathematicians. So um, I've seen a lot of people married off to, who were mathematical, married off to people who could not have children. They were infertile. And so the people with the mathematical minds uh, were not able to reproduce. And this is, this is very widespread, not just in America, but other countries too. Now, um, the vineyards, the vast vineyards, beautiful vineyards in Northern California, north of San Francisco, in the Napa and, Val and Sonoma Valleys, have been taken over by the Rothschilds, but they're proxies for Castro, the Castros and the ancient Iranian bloodlines. And uh, UC Davis uh, uh, created those vineyards, created the uh, varieties of, of, uh, of the grape stock. They created the winemaking processes. And, um, and so UC Davis, again, through the vineyards and, and winemaking, are very, very tied into Castro and his endeavors in California. Um, the uh, first United Nations was built in San Francisco, and it's called UN Plaza, and it's uh, at the Civic Center of San Francisco, where the City Hall, the big library, where all the anti-war demonstrations were held against the 2003 Iraq War. And um, I, I just go and walk by that building every time I go to San Francisco, San Francisco because I always wanted to know why it was there. And when you go into the underground, the BART, uh, there are these um, paintings on the walls as you're standing there waiting for the train of Bacchus, the god, the god of wine, and uh, uh, these uh, Greek figures, and they're decorating that that Bart station for some for some unknown reason. Well, then I finally tied it all together because there's also a statue of Assurbanipal, who was an Assyrian king who created libraries. And that's uh, very close to, right next to the uh, the UN building. I don't know what it's used for now, but later on the UN was relocated to New York City. Uh, I suppose because it's the economic center of the United States and a, a big global center. So um, there was uh, there was the UN, and uh, also the the Jesuits when they destroy and these ancient Iranian and bloodlines, when they destroy civilizations and countries, uh, for instance, first they created the Etruscan civilization in Italy. They destroyed that and razed it, and then they built the Roman Empire. That was all Iranians, Iranian soldiers, Iranian Caesars, everything, and um, they. Um, um, oh dear, I just got lost. Um, I'm sorry, uh, I, I'm, I'm getting hit with frequencies. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, the, um, oh dear. <laughs> anyway, the, the, the UN got moved and, and the UN is all part of, uh, these ancient Iranians controlling the world. And, well, you, you, you were talking about the statue of Asurbanipal. Oh, Asurbanipal, yeah. And I, I couldn't figure out what that was there for or those um, those paintings in the, in the basement or down in the BART station. But now I do understand uh, since discovering uh, the Castro land grants in California. And so they own... Uh, the uh, the nuke labs they they own the University of California I mean they control it they don't need to own it directly they have uh, the power uh, to make all the decisions for them and um, also uh, the Bay Area has been chosen 
by the Rockefeller Foundation, four cities in the Bay Area have been chosen to be uh, special cities for the New World Order. They have a hundred listed on their website. And uh, the Bay Area has four of them. I don't know anywhere else, any other uh, any others that have more than one city that are designated these special cities. And they are Berkeley, where I'm living, Oakland, next door, Alameda, and San Francisco. And they are wiring up all these cities. They're, they're putting uh, uh, surveillance packets. They're cementing them into the sidewalk street corners. Uh, they put in new lamps all over the place that um, they can monitor everyone. They can hit you with electromagnetic frequencies. They can talk to you through them. Uh, they are integrated with the cell phones now, with the smart meters, with these um, uh, underground uh, uh, surveillance system that's, that's being put in now all over the Bay Area. I mean, all over um, these four special cities, probably all over the Bay Area, too. And uh, the smart meters are transmitting uh, their uh, every minute, uh, everything electrical, including the, the mind thoughts, the thinking of any people in the house. And that is being transmitted for all the houses offshore to... Um, Ships that are fitted out 250 miles offshore out in the international limits because it's completely illegal to do this. And they're transferring all of our personal data that they pick up with the smart meters to these banks of servers on ships. Um, and we've watched three of them getting retrofitted with warehouses on top of the deck, mats and um, uh, some, there were, mats and is one of the, the uh, the the shipping uh, the name of one of the ships owned by what were the others? Matson Maersk. Oh, Matson Maersk, and and there was another one. I don't know what it was named. It was Maersk, I believe. Um, okay, and uh, those then are uh, there. All the data is sent to those offshore ships, and then it's transferred up, uploaded onto the Inmarsat satellites that were involved in MH17, the um, the false flag uh, plane crash of the Malaysia uh, MH17 in the Ukraine a couple of years ago. And all of that is transferred to uh, London headquarters. So you can see this global spying system is being installed. And this is all under the, um, the guidance of the Jesuits. So here again, uh, Castro is very involved. The House of Castro is very involved in this. And, um, um, I mean, it's unbelievable what's happening. I just cannot believe it. I can't believe what's happening in Berkeley. It used to be a village two years ago. Uh, once Janet Napolitano came, oh, there were old hippies on the bus and people smoking pot everywhere and dancing in the streets. And there was just a fun, playful a wonderful ambiance, and it attracted many people to come and live in Berkeley for the quality of life and the the freedom, the personal freedom here. And it has been completely stripped. It's stripped of feelings. It's stripped of uh, neighborhood people on the buses anymore. Um, the university has forced all the landlords to repaint and, and re- um, uh, landscape their houses. Uh, they are now just sending people to the houses. They tore up the steps on my porch. I have a separate entrance into this house and they put one of these surveillance packages without my permission or telling me or anything right under the steps on my porch. Not to mention um, the whole upstairs, apartment upstairs is wired to do surveillance and harassment with EMF on us constantly night and day. Um, the students in the houses all around where we are are uh, outfitted with the electronics, with the antennas, with the smart meters, and with very powerful cell phones 
they are being taught how to integrate all of these systems so that they can harass and destroy um, companies they work for, countries they return to, they can overthrow their own governments. This is all part of Soros' uh, 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 a colored revolution uh, package that he has overthrown so many countries and governments with. So uh, these guys are big, big players and they're lethal players. They're very, very dangerous and they're all around us and this rollout is happening very, very fast. And the meeting with Obama and Castro was the beginning of the handoff by Obama and the Jesuits in the Congress. There are lots of them. Everyone in Obama's uh, administration, um, no, his, uh, his staff, they are all trained Jesuits and over 10% of Congress uh, are Jesuits and now the Supreme Court, um, many of them are Jesuit trained as well. And um, uh, the uh, Judge Scalia, who very conservative judge on the U.S. Supreme Court, who uh, just died, he was actually assassinated on a, a ranch in Texas, uh, because about five days before he died, he had turned down one of Obama's um, pet um, initiatives in court, I mean in Congress, and there were other reasons too, but Scalia was extremely, um, uh, very, very conservative about the Constitution and protected it more strongly than anyone else on the Supreme Court. So they had to get him off and they'll put uh, some kind of a moderate or half liberal or something in if they can. And Obama's already chosen a one I doubt that he will uh, be uh, passed by the Senate, though, because the Republicans control the Senate right now. So it's likely that the Senate will uh, appoint the next uh, Supreme Court judge to replace Scalia. Um, so there are lots of changes happening in the U.S. Uh, this new moderate judge is sort of shaky on gun rights which is a constitutional right. And there was something else that he was a little shaky on. But um, I can see what's happening and what's coming. It's really obvious. And uh, it's these, these very significant ceremonies and rituals of the, the Pope and the Russian uh, patriarch visiting Castro Obama visiting Castro, and then uh, Obama's going on to Argentina when he finishes in Cuba. So that's probably something to do with the Pope, or Antarctica and the Pope, or wine control in Antarctica and, and the, the one, one global religion and so forth. And believe me, Obama does not like white people, and he wrote it in his own biography when he was quite young right now um <clears throat> given all of these kind of transitions where does putin fit into all of this and well, his kind of worldview and the actions that he's taking okay well this is this is sort of a global war against the past against the western economy against the atlanticists and so you have to break down the old. So they're breaking down the old economy. And they're using, uh, for instance, the Rand Corporation report, which recommended uh, destroying countries in North Africa and the Middle East, and then using those displaced populations to uh, scatter or invade all over Europe. Um, so... Um, but they need a new they need a new economy to replace the old one and so you take out the old and bring in the new they're doing it at the same time and so putin is their um is their flag man holding the staff and leading this creation of the silk road uh china's involved also and the silk road is not just uh through a Eurasia down to the Middle East. It's from the Middle East 
uh, through the uh, the ocean lanes all the way to Southeast Asia and beyond uh, to China and, and Japan and Korea. And that's a very, very old, uh, very ancient trading route. And that route ended in the Middle East at Yemen at the town of Aden. And where are these wars happening? That's exactly where the wars are happening in Yemen, in, in uh, Libya, in Syria, in Iraq. And what Putin did was he had to go in and he had to clean the terrorists out of Syria and train uh, the Syrian army and then involve other countries uh, who were willing to join in this, um, in this uh, cleansing, in this liquidation of these horribly dangerous um, terrorists that were created by the West. They were created by NATO, by Gladio, by the Pentagon, by the Rand Corporation, by, um, by Wall Street, by the Beltway, Maryland Beltway, where um, those are where all the arm, arm sellers are. And so this whole economy of destruction and perpetual war and plundering and uh, genocide, all of that is what these parasitic countries have been living and surviving on and keeping their economies going. And Putin is coming in with a new model where there will be more of a level playing field. Wealth will be, creation, will be created by trading, peaceful trading, instead of war. Uh, destroying things never creates wealth. It just allows the stronger to plunder the weaker and leave a big mess. And so Putin is, uh, has created a bank, the BRICS Bank, that is suitable and designed for the populations it will be serving. And he is creating um, a stronger Russia a, uh, with a balanced budget. He spends 80% of his time for, for the 15 years he's been in office. He spent improving the civilian infrastructure. These are what he's doing in other countries as well. And um, he will have bases, Russia will have permanent bases in Syria now. But what's happened is when Putin came in with air power to cover the ground war in Syria against the terrorists, uh, Iran came to help. They sent soldiers and equipment and missiles and so forth. Um, they also sent them, they taught the Yemenis, they didn't have a budget, a military budget, they don't have any money because they can't pump any oil. So um, they went to Iran and said, would you teach us how to make ballistic missiles? So the, the Yemenis make all their own ballistic missiles and all they're fighting Libya, I'm, the um, Saudis with and the mercenaries, they're just fighting them with um, ballistic missiles and guns that they can carry and shoulder rockets and they're beating them. They sunk five Saudi Arabian Navy ships in one day a week ago. And they sunk 14 before that. And uh, they killed 300 uh, Blackwater soldiers, mercenaries, with one rocket and 20 colonels, U.S. colonels, who were their commanders. And um, the UAE bought Blackwater, half of it, 49% of it, they have 800 Blackwater soldiers in the UAE part of Blackwater, and 300 of them were killed in one day. And then the Yemeni shot their guns and their tanks up. And uh, about three weeks ago, uh, Blackwater said, we're packing up and leaving this week. We can't afford to be here and fight in Yemen. Uh, we, it's costing us too much. So, um, these, these ancient tribes and ancient people are winning because they have strategy and they have the support of Russia and also China and also Iran. And, um, and uh, the, the, um, the, 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 the period of the 
the economy based on plunder and thieving and genocide is on the way out in this peaceful Silk Road economy is coming in and it will create much greater wealth. And Putin is the one who was chosen by President Yeltsin of Russia to save Mother Russia. And Russia has also saved Europe at least four times in the last century. And I'm sure that Russia will end up, Putin will end up saving Europe one more time. He told them not to do the refugees, um, that they, they were housed in uh, Turkey for a year and a half. All these refugees from all the countries that NATO was plundering and destroying were, um, they uh, put them in, in camps in, in um, Turkey. And then uh, when it was time, Merkel opened the door and the floodgates uh, uh, allowed all these people to go rushing into, into Europe and it's turned into a gigantic mess. Well, it's destroying Europe, in fact, and that's exactly what the RAND Corporation designed it for. Right. So it, it, it seems if, if, if we were to summarize uh, what's going on at this time, you would say that Obama's Cuba Argentini Tina visits and the 322 Brussels false flag are really a handover to the Jesuit mind control forces, while Putin is creating a peaceful model of wealth created by trading, and that model spends 80% 80, 80 of its time creating civilian infrastructure. That's right. He quadrupled the income for the Russian people in that period. He did many, many, many things. And um, basically, uh, Putin had to go through a process of being disillusioned about the West and especially about America because he too had been brainwashed by um, uh, powerful Russians, who, influential Russians uh, from the Soviet era. He was in the KGB. And of course, these were Russians who had money in American banks. And he won't allow any uh, government uh, workers in Russia to have money in foreign, in, in American banks. So that was one way he began addressing the horrible corruption in Russia that's um, just wasted and plundered a lot of money. Uh, but uh, I want you just to know that Russia has always been ruled by Iranians. The, the czars, um, czar, T-S-A-R, by the way, um, is an ancient Iranian word for hunter. So the czar of Russia was um, not only an Iranian, but had the label of, uh, from the Iranian culture or language. Now, um could you give us sort of your kind of brief overview of an analysis of the significance of Putin's sudden pullout in Syria? Well, um, Putin said um, uh, in that UN speech, I believe, and, and afterwards, he said many times, he, and he does, he prepares people. He's the best communicator I've ever seen in a leader. And you can see also that the men around him are very, and women too, are very, very capable. They're very good at what they do. They're very professional. And all of them respect each other and have worked together almost the whole time Putin has been president. He doesn't do purges. Um, if someone, uh, he gives people a job to do, he tells them what he expects. And when he expects it, he, they have a, a calendar or whatever, and and he directs them on, on what he wants to do. And this is after listening to his own advisors. He always listens to his own advisors, and he has very good advisors. And then, um, and then he leaves them alone. And if they screw up, he removes them and he replaces them. That is that simple. He's um, he's not a power hungry 
crazy person, um, like a megalomaniac like Erdogan or, um, or completely incompetent like Obama. He's very competent. He's very careful. He makes his own decisions, but only after uh, watching everything. And he uses his martial arts experience of um, strategy and timing and, and uh, playing off the weaknesses of the, the opponent. And he doesn't act first. He waits until everyone else has act, and then he plays off of their positions. And he keeps winning that way because he has strategy and he's honest. Um, he's also been in their house. He's, he's met all the oligarchs. He knows how all the criminals and, and the politicians and the, and the governments, he knows how all of that works, the militaries. So he's been uh, quiet, but he's been very skilled at, um, at doing what he's done and accomplishing it. And he's been treated very badly by the West, very, very badly by Europe, very, very badly by America. And uh, Russia and the Russian people and Putin don't deserve that. They've helped many countries. They've helped many people. Uh, many Russians, 20 million Russians died, soldiers in World War II, saving Europe. So... Um, it's very inappropriate, and it's, um, it's not wise, and it's very short-sighted. And what's going to happen is the people who are doing that are going to fall, and Putin is going to move forward with people who want what he's offering, what he's putting together to be part of it. And all together, uh, the countries, the militaries, uh, the neighbors will help each other. Uh, different ethnic groups. What 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 are they fighting for? They're not. They're being used. They have coexisted in the Middle East for thousands of years without fighting with each other. They were peaceful. They respected each other's cultures and religions. It's the U.S. that is creating these false um, divisions and these uh, uh, very hostile opposing positions that uh, they can exploit and cause uh, wars and so forth with, that weaken a country, that destroy the population, that cause genocide, and so forth and so on. They only, only benefit the Pentagon and the Beltway and, and American arms makers and, and people involved in, in, in uh, profiteering. So... I think that um, the transition is happening. It's going to have happen. It's going to be very smooth. Uh, the biggest problem of all was getting rid of these terrorists that came straight out of the Rand Corporation, uh, the Pentagon, and the Beltway, and uh, also politicians like like Soros and and Brzezinski. and they even fooled presidents, U.S. presidents, Al Qaeda was created and okayed under President Jimmy Carter by Brzezinski. And I don't believe that President Jimmy Carter really knew what was happening. Um, so the, um, the, the task now is to fi finish cleaning up, cleaning out these terrorists from the Middle East. And what Putin was able to do by going into Syria and providing cover to the Kurds and the other soldiers, Syrian army, he helped to retrain it. Um, he uh, uh, provided updating on the, um, the, the, for instance, on the jets, uh, more better protection from um, jet attacks or, or fighter jet attacks from the enemy. Uh, he put in new radar systems in Syria so that Israel can't land or, or um, uh, land a plane or send will launch one off into the into the atmosphere without <laughs> Syria knowing everything they're doing. And uh, so there will be no surprise attacks on Syria and Putin has authorized any fighter jet pilot, in Syria under his command or under President Assad's command 
to immediately attack and down any foreign planes that are not supposed to be there. They don't even need to get permission to do it. He just said, shoot them down. And um, so there will be peace and security and peaceful trading coming to the Middle East. Uh, the countries, anyway, um, they, they will be modernized and rebuilt by China, by Russia, by Iran. And so there will be a whole new Silk Road Middle East infrastructure um, in in uh, 10 or 20 years. And um, it's, it's wonderful for the people there. It's horrible to go through this and to lose so many people, civilians and everything. But um, it's how the, the United States and the West wanted to do it, and they're losing. They're going to lose. And the U.S. is being stripped down to gunmetal in the Bay Area. If you look at cars on the road, the number of cars that have uh, bright colors or whatever are disappearing. And the majority of cars that you see now are either some shade of gunmetal gray or they're black or some are white. Uh, but the, um, the whole future of America is to be Castro's military for uh, the global suppression of, of humanity. And what he did to Cuba, which you described so succinctly, um, a land of happiness and dancing and music and celebration and beautiful climate and a beautiful location, he squashed it. He killed it. He killed their spirits. He killed their uh, their um, their uh, religious beliefs. He killed their spirituality. He just destroyed. It's it's inhumane what he did, but he wants to do it to the Americas. It's coming here. It's already started. I'm seeing it in Berkeley. Um, so the uh, Europe also is being destroyed. Uh, they can't get it together to even defend themselves. It's pathetic. And um, they're doing horrible things now with those refugees that they invited with open arms into Europe. They're being herded into refugee camps in Ukraine, in Eastern Europe, and they are going to be harvested for their organs. It's already happening, and it's already set up. It's already happening in the Ukraine, around the Odessa area. And it's uh, former Georgian president, Saakashvili, who started the organ harvesting of the um, Ukrainian people after the coup d'etat that the CIA did in uh, March of 2014. Right, right. Um, uh, are there any points that you wanted to raise uh, in this interview that you haven't gotten to? Well, what I want to say is there are two, two choices that people have now. And one choice is to go with the new BRICS Bank and the Silk Road economy in the regions where that's going to happen. Putin has to still squeeze uh, NATO, Gladio, and the terrorists out of Eurasia. But more and more countries are coming to help. The citizens are coming out of the villages and, and, and cities with guns, and they are working as uh, civilian militia with the Syrian army, with the foreign troops that are there from Iran, and, and the Hezbollah from Lebanon is helping them. And now even the Syrian army and the Iraqi army are working on both on, on their own sides of the border. They have a shared border to, um, to destroy these terrorists because they're the same terrorists just crossing that border back and forth into those two countries. And it's just incredible. Uh, the, the Iraqi army that was just almost on their knees and, and the Syrian army also, the Iraqi army, has already reclaimed 50% of the land that the terrorists took from them. So uh, very soon, I Iraq and Syria will be cleared out. And then uh, other countries in the Middle East that want to get rid of these terrorists will have partners to come and help them and show them how 
to um, to get rid of them. And then uh, the whole underbarrel belly of Russia all the way to China, Xinjiang in China, which is where the Uyghur Islamic tribes are in China. Um, they have to clean them all out of there, but uh, it'll be easier as other countries see what Putin has done and have confidence to step up and oppose the U.S. The, the U.S. just has a, a death grip on every region, every continent, every um, every country that it goes into, and you know they're destroying Malaysia, and you and I love uh, what we saw in Malaysia. It's beautiful, a beautiful modern country that Dr. Mahathir created um, even out of jungle. He built a whole new uh, capital for Malaysia, just beautiful, that represented the architecture of uh, all over the world. It's a beautiful, beautiful city. And um, new airport and, and the income is greatly increased. He raised the income and the quality of life and everything for the Malaysian people. But he also started the, the Petronas Oil Company to develop uh, the oil deposits, the oil riches of Malaysia. But that money went to creating a new infrastructure for the Malaysian people and in, in, in uh, improving their lives, the quality of their lives. So what's going to happen is in the areas where Russia has influence um, and in this Silk Road economy and these, these regions and areas that are part of the Silk Road, um, there will be a lot of uh, peace and, and trading and so forth. There will probably be some skirmishes, but uh, most likely they'll be settled diplomatically or politically. And um, the U.S. will be used um, as the army, the military, that goes in and destroys countries and or enforces, um, enforces laws or, or occupations or whatever. I don't really know what they have planned for other countries, uh, like what's going to happen in in um, South America. I know smart meters are going in there. Nuclear power is absolutely a Jesuit fingerprint. Um, but uh, Putin is building, he's getting contracts to build nuclear power plants in India, China, Argentina, all kinds of countries, Brazil, um, but we don't want fission, uh, fission uh, uh, generated electricity because you have these horrible um, problems with the, the spent fuel and, and the global pollution of the environment with the radiation. It's killing everybody in the biosphere. But I do think that Russia and China have something up their sleeve about uh, designing a new kind of nuclear reactor that's based on fusion. And fusion does not release electricity. I mean, um, uh, radioactivity. It's very different from fission. Right. And and who's doing the fusion? Oh, uh, China. I'm China. sorry. Russia already has fusion reactors. Hmm. They look like big spheres on sitting on uh, tripods, three legs. I see. Um, I really do think that's what they're going to do. Um, uh, what happens to South America, they're going to mine a lot of it. Um, we've seen the map of the global infrastructure that's going in in all the continents. It's new roadways and uh, that connect countries to countries. And they definitely have a plan. And uh, yeah, a lot that, of the roads that are... That was right. very impressive to see a, a, a road going from St. Petersburg through the land bridge all the way to New York. Well, they have it, and um, it, it's going to be it's going to be here sooner than we even think. Yeah. Um, yeah but so, a, lot of, so a lot of good I, things I are going to happen. I, I guess that the Western economy is just going to fall crumble and fall and, and the people will just have to wake up and then play catch up, which is what civilizations have always done. Well, um, they're just going to be kind of the leftover breadcrumbs on the floor if yeah. they don't 
uh, figure out what what they what what they want to do. Yeah. Um, I know that the United States is going to um, be flipped into something that's even worse than communism, because we had two KGB generals come to the Livermore Nuclear Weapons Lab in 1989 when I just started working there. And um, my lab partner came bursting in the, into the lab one morning and he said, oh, there are two KGB generals here. And I said, what are they here for? This is the Cold War and that's the enemy and this is the most guarded place in America. What are they doing here? And he said, oh, they're transferring the, the technologies of co political control to the U.S. government here at this lab. And by the way, Livermore built secretly with the Soviet Union. They built HARP together. So, um, so then I said, well, why are, they, uh, why are they flipping? What are they doing that for? And he said, oh, they're flipping the two economies. And I said, what do you mean? He said, they're going to make... Um, Russia into the United States and they're going to make the United States into the Soviet Union only it's going to be much worse and, and what it's going to be is they, what they what what Castro's been setting up uh, with the Jesuits in uh, Cuba in Cuba because they now have the transhumanist um, technologies r remote neural technologies with the chemtrails and, and the and the other uh, implants in in the brain, so it's communism with uh, artificial AI entrainment. It's a nightmare beyond a nightmare. Right. It's a nightmare beyond a nightmare. It's and that's gonna, what it's, they're implementing in. in they the, definitely are in the U.S. And yes, none and the only uh, very few of the of the of the uh, only the alternative uh, media, the alternative uh, leaders are talking about that at all. And I just came from a meeting of, of an NGO of targeted individuals that's trying to get going. And it was, it was so targeted by an outside agency that they produced uh, a, a noise in in their uh, in the meeting that it just broke it up. You know, a, an online conference. It's a frequency that just um, disables your ability to think. Yeah, yeah, that's what they did, and they kind of broke it up so that, that the proposals could not be presented. So it's going to be quite quite the accomplishment for. Uh, humanity to really get itself together, I think. Well, um, people can educate themselves about it, and um, and it's the the technologies are really wicked. They're very very wicked, and yeah. they're not for they're not for helping us. They they're not for helping us survive or or prosper or or cre or be productive or anything. Um, they want to destroy the Western economy, and, and they just roll the whole project up and throw it in the garbage can. And that's what they did. That's what the, um, the Iranians did with the Etruscan civilization and replaced it with the Roman Empire. And, and um, they've been doing it. It's just, um, it's, just, um, it's just recycling over and over again. And then they strip all the wealth off of it. Well, where did all the money come from? to set up this new world order. This has cost vast amounts of money. And where it came from was World War II looting the accumulated wealth from the last 5,000 years of the Silk Road. Right. And that's why uh, the Emperor of Japan and the Imperial Princes were sent to 12 Southeast Asian countries to loot all of the jewels, the gold, the anything of any value, even uh, art on paper, documents, they took everything. And who would have known that tremendous amount of wealth was there other than the ancient Iranians? Right. right. And so that's, that's what they're using. That, that's the, um, the Yamashita's gold, the, the treasure uh, that Japan 
uh, managed to loot and they hid it. Uh, well, they hid it all over Japan and under the uh, Imperial Palace in Tokyo. But um, then the U.S. embargoed Japan. And so they, uh, the Japanese sent 86 or something engineers to the Philippines. And they were told to construct hidden repositories for huge amounts of gold bullion and, and treasure that no one could ever find hidden in the jungle. So the Japanese uh, engineers went to the Philippines. Um, the imperial princes would visit. They would arrive in submarines that would land near a beach and a, a driver would be there to pick them up. Um, and um, and so when the embargo happened, the, the, uh, the Red Cross ships, they were using uh, cargo ships with uh, Red Crosses painted on them, saying they had wounded on board. Well, they had all the treasures of Southeast Asia on board instead. And so they diverted them to the Philippines. And these repositories were loaded up to the ceiling with gold bars and all kinds of treasures. And um, when they had finished the very last one and loaded all the treasure into it, the imperial prince held a party in that last um, repository for all the engineers. And so they were all drunk, singing, singing, so uh, drinking sake, and they were singing Japanese songs they loved and hanging on each other. Oh, they were so drunk, and all of a sudden, the prince took his driver by the hand at midnight and walked out the door and blew up the entrance to that repository, so all the engineers died. Uh, and, of course, they had knowledge of where all these repositories were. Well, the prince, the Japanese prince, had a map, so the, um, the young driver took him back to the beach, and, um, and um, the the Prince gave him the keys to the car and said, it's yours. And he got in the submarine and went back to Japan. And when I was in Japan doing 20 speaking tours, I couldn't believe how many NGOs for the rainforest exist in Japan. Well, they're spy places for these uh, monitoring these repositories. So that's what funded that's what funded this new world order thing. Right. And, and their and their mission was to stop any democratic movements. And that's the secret treaty of Verona right. from uh, 1823. There were three secret meetings held by the Jesuits. They were terrified of the United States. They hate the constitution more than anything. And the secret treaty of Verona guaranteed that Russia, Prussia, France, and Russia would all act together and pool money into a fund they donated money to every year to overthrow and defeat every democratic movement on the continent and in the future in places where uh, there was nothing there now, but but but, but these movements if people were there were um, uh, likely to uh, pop out, pop up. So um, so that's that's a pretty crazy story. But that's yeah, how they did that, it. That's how our world's ruled. That's how it's really ruled, and it's the signs and symbols. And by the way, the Farnese's also use Alexander's name in is their middle name or their first name. The um, and uh, Fidel Castro's middle name is Alejandro. Isn't that interesting? And Pope Paul III's name was Alessandro Farnese. And when they were uh, the Ptolemies ruling Egypt, um, all of the females. Um, and these brothers would always marry their sisters, as in the ancient Egyptian style. Although they were Hellenic, they were from um, Macedonia. Um, and um, the, the females that the pharaoh married was always named 
um, Cleopatra. Huh. Ceremonial names. Yeah, well, that's part of uh, um, the the end of the Roman. That that's part of uh, it reflects Cleopatra's uh, history. Right, right. Well, uh, we've we've come to the end of this segment, and I I really want to thank you uh, for taking time out. And um, is there a final word you'd like to? leave with our viewing audience? Well, I'd just like to thank everyone who's viewing and sharing our videos. Um, people do seem to like them. They are meant to educate people. Education empowers people. The world turns on information. And the most important thing is to learn to trust yourself. And when you trust yourself, you don't need the, the, the university. You don't need the professors. You don't need the classroom. That's all set up so the professors can steal the intellectual property of young people. You have to relearn everything once you get out because what they teach you is not relevant to the real world that you're going to live in. And the real university is the library. So please, learn to do research, um, start looking around at signs and symbols. Um, the internet is really a great way to do research. I could never do what I've done without uh, having a, a, a computer. Uh, they, they, have, they have access to so much information and you could just check out anything. Can you imagine trying to do this in a library? <laughs> you couldn't. So. Um, look at what you have, the resources and tools around you. Simplify your life. You'll be much happier. And if you can live somewhere where you have a garden and you can grow your own food or some of it, that's also a wonderful part of your life because what we are is what we eat. And Putin, by the way, is very opposed to... Um, GMO and he will not allow it in Russia. He's he's uh, um, he's shutting it down, and I'm sure that the Ukraine eventually will be part of Russia. Will be returned to Russia, and uh, Monsanto's trying to take it over. That's why the war started, uh, the coup started in uh, in the Ukraine, and um, and that's the biggest breadbasket probably in the world. That's another reason they wanted it. So. Um, uh, the, the countries that don't, aren't flexible and refuse to change and modernize um, are just going to fall by the wayside. They're going to slowly just go into decline. And um, it's really um, a new world and a new time, and, and it's exciting. It doesn't matter how old or how young you are. Be part of it. Um, don't sit home and be afraid. Uh, especially of the information that we're, we're giving you, uh, let it empower you. There's, uh, you have a whole new life in front of you, and, and life, you know, your new, your life starts today, every day. So um, we, we really appreciate um, that your comments, they're wonderful. Uh, we've incorporated a lot of the information into our research and into our interviews. Um, and thanks to all of you uh, with different experiences and different knowledge uh, sharing it. And I'm sure we've learned as much as you've learned. And, um, and then, of course, we need your donations. We appreciate your donations. Um, uh, I love the, um, the messages people sent me for my birthday. Um, it's, uh, we're a community. We're a community of people. It's not just Alfred and I doing interviews. We're a community of people communicating with the um, technology that is available now, and this is changing too. So always be on the lookout for new opportunities and, and new things to try, and, but don't get yourself ungrounded. Stay grounded with family, with neighbors, with um, uh, your whatever your social activities are or whatever and do things that help other people 
because that helps you even more. Thank you very, very much, Alfred. Well, well, thank you. Thank, thank you, Loren. And um, we look forward to you joining us again as events develop. Yes, for sure. We only have to wait one day. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. It's happening so fast. Right. So thank you very much. Sure.